Brown baby. Hello, hello, hello. I am really excited this morning about what we're going to do for you. I have three amazing spirits, three amazing souls hanging out with me today to talk about the legacy that we are bringing to the table in terms of sharing who we are as same gender loving people, 50 and over, and what we hope to do in terms of trailing a path for younger same gender loving folk who may be coming behind us. I have the wonderful Paul Glass, I have the ever so dashing Shirley Royster, and I have the lovely Catherine. Catherine, Shirley, Paul are very dear people to me, and we're going to talk to Paul first about the Legacy Project and exactly what um, that means to him and, and what he hopes to do in terms of sharing that information to younger people. Paul, you want to talk to us about the Legacy Project? Well, thanks so much, Greg, for having us here today. It's really been um, inspiring, and it seems uh, it's a, b a bit of a dream come true, actually. Mm. You know, it kind of sprang out of some um, intimate conversations, actually, um, when we, we first began to talk about um, what kind of legacy do we really want to leave behind mm -hmm. in terms of who we are, how we have lived our lives as... Um, you know, adults now who were born and raised in the Boston area and have um, come out and lived our lives as same gender loving people. And we began this conversation a few, several months ago and, and that was a conversation that kind of came out of um, our connection to the Elders of Color Outreach Project. Mm -hmm. We have been doing this um, I guess it's really been um, events over the last several months uh, since February when we came together as same-gender-loving um, individuals, both male and female, um, at the behest of, uh, of the LGBT Aging Project. So we kind of um, we looked at some community leaders around um, those who considered themselves community leaders or some um, others who considered us to be community leaders. And I think um, when we look at that from, look at community leaders from the perspective that we were out and about and okay with being who we are um, and disclosing who we are, disclosing the fact that we were um, uh, same gender loving mm -hmm. and what we wanted to do in terms of bringing, um, building community for folks who were 50, or 50 and, and above. And the challenge, what was the challenge for you in terms of coming out and being the whole or complete person that, that you are today? Well, my first, uh, my biggest challenge, I think, uh, in terms of coming out was just whether I was gonna come out to my family. Um, it was, uh, I've always known that I was gay, probably since I was a little boy. Didn't quite know what to call it at the time, but I always knew that I um, was same gender loving and I love my gender. <laughs> I love being around them. I, lo I loved um, what it, it, how it made me feel. And I tried to put some things into perspective as um, from a child's perspective, I guess. And it wasn't until um, I was well out of, out of high school and until I really began to um, experience my, have some experiences around yeah, connecting with same gender loving people. And in high school, you were able to begin dating or, and, and your family, how did they relate to that when you started dating or whatever it was that you did in terms of experience? I was still in the closet in high school for the most part, you know. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think that I, I considered myself in the closet, but I don't think that it was really that, uh, considered that way from a lot of other folks. You know, I was, um, I was ridiculed a lot about my feminine ways, if you will. And I kind of railed against it as much as I could. And I really was um, in denial mm -hmm. in, in terms of um, revealing who I was to other people and, and really saying it out loud that I was gay. So were you featuring hot pink and 
fuchsia and all those kind of <laughs> colors. Well, I wasn't into uh, lots of colors by, because back then it wasn't, um, we didn't have a lot of colors that, to choose from, you know, particularly for guys, it was mostly brown and black. But, you know, I did the best I could to mm -hmm. make it really look sharp and very um, clean uh, cut. I was I mean, always had a, um, a very clean cut haircut. Mm -hmm. I always made certain that I dressed <coughs> impeccably. Mm -hmm. um, and it was just, a, you know, I kind of created my own little style. So one of the things that I think happens with those, a lot of young people, is it gets very kind of there. <coughs> people have to, were mm -hmm. you doing any of that kind of stuff? I did it subconsciously because it was just a natural thing to do. Mm -hmm. And every time I did it, it was like, what are you doing, boy? <laughs> <laughs> I would get to come, what are you doing? What's that? <laughs> you don't do that. Men don't do that. <laughs> so I kind of was, uh, you know, I was always conscious about what to do with my hands. Right. And, you know, I was, you know, and even, you know, growing up in a family, a large family, we had lots of boys. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm one of five boys. So and I have older brothers, and you know they were, um, uh, you know, I guess kind of blazing the, the trail for me. You know, they they went through the the usual heterosexual kind of um, um, experiences, I guess. You know, as teenagers, they're trying to connect with them with young women and going to parties and want to want to date, and then they went uh, that kind of graduated to getting married and having children and the whole nine. So by the time that I was in high school, I had two older brothers who were already married with children. Right, 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 right. Okay, so I want to go ahead and talk to Shirley. Let me hear from Shirley in terms of your challenges. And uh, tell us a little bit first about Shirley and her accomplishments. Um, my challenge was um, as a girl, I was expected to get married and have children and take care of my family. That was it. That was, that was supposed to have been my recipe for life. Mm -hmm. And um, I rebelled against that from an early age. Um, I kissed my first girl when I was 14 and loved it. Loved it absolutely, just loved it. And from then on, um, I think it was difficult just trying to be me. Because when you are a same sex loving person, um, it's not acceptable. You're going against nature, you're going against the norm, you're going against the church, you're going against everybody. Mm -hmm. And so um, trying to be who I was and um, um, hiding who I was, who I really was. Mm -hmm. uh, and I did, I went on and had kids and uh, you know, tried to go with men and um, it never worked for me. I was just too, um, one guy said to me, why are you so damn mannish? You know, <laughs> what, what the hell does that mean? You know, I'm just being me, but now I'm mannish. You know, and I, I, don't, I don't think I was mannish. It was just that I was more independent. I had my own brain, and I could think for myself, and I didn't take shit. Sorry. It's <laughs> a word. It's a word. It's a word. And so um, I was called managed and, and um, I got into a, a couple of domestic violence issues because I was going against the grain. You yeah. know, I was not submissive and I was not going to just sit by and be told what to do and not have a, an opinion. Your children, how did they respond or react to your being same gender? Loving? I have to tell you, when I had my my first daughter, she grew up with me being lesbian. And so it wasn't a challenge I didn't have to come out to her because that was the only thing that she knew. And my second daughter, um, I decided to have her when I was lesbian. I didn't want my oldest daughter to have uh, just no other sibling. So they both knew. And um, I had many friends and I was out and about in Boston in the larger, gay community, gay black community that we enjoyed so much in the 70s. It was a wonderful time. Your accomplishment, you have done so many amazing things. Yes, tell I me. have. Yes, statewide cab. Um, statewide, well, let me tell you, the first accomplishment I had was meeting Catherine. Um, we've been together 30 years. Whoa. So that's my biggest accomplishment. Mm. My second accomplishment was in 2000, I got to go to South Africa to the International Conference, International AIDS Conference in Durban, South Africa mm -hmm. with the Department of Public Health. Mm -hmm. 
I was the first black woman who chaired the Ryan White Planning Council. And um, the other major accomplishment was for Cambridge Cares, I was one of their recipients of their Illumination um, Award. Mm -hmm. And Belinda Dunn and I worked at AIDS Action on, I worked on the policy committee with Robert Greenwald, mm -hmm. and Belinda did her healing hands. And she said to me, don't come in here with no crap. <laughs> <laughs> if you're gonna come in here, be real. Right. And so that was my other accomplishment, was just making that commitment to be who I was and being out about my HIV status and to embrace it and to live it. Mm -hmm. And again, that was thankful to Catherine because without Catherine, that probably wouldn't have been possible. Okay, so I do want to um, talk with Catherine about the wonderfulness that goes on in her life and the legacy that she uh, has trailblazed for a lot of the younger people coming along. The floor is on you, baby. Well, thank you, Gregory Jean, for uh, allowing us to come and speak about the Le Legacy Project today. Um, but I wanted to, uh, while listening to Paul and listening to Shirley, um, I, I, a couple of things resonated with me in terms of how they grew up. Mm -hmm. um, I, I grew up as a tomboy and I always loved to, you know, you know, the climbing, the playing tag, uh, climbing trees, <laughs> uh, running with the guys, running with the boys. A and uh, I didn't know why I liked it, but I did. I mean, a lot of people who uh, are tom tomboys don't necessarily, you know, turn out to be lesbian or gay. But in my case, it, that's, that's what happened. Um, you know, my challenge to, to coming out was uh, I didn't come out until maybe later, my late 20s. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I believe it's because I was really um, repressed. My sexual energies were repressed, that we were living at a, in a time when you weren't allowed to express your sexuality anyway. And even if you were, it was very um, rigid gender norms. You know, women wore dresses and they weren't, um, uh, they always had to sit back and wait for the man to make the first move or to make any move. Women had to sit with their legs t together and you know you could never cross your legs I mean, <laughs> heck no I mean, you know? so yeah, yeah that's right so uh, uh, at, at a time when we were really in those uh, wearing those really frilly dresses and outfits I, I remember my mother who was a seamstress taking great pride in, in dressing me you know, dressing me up you know from head to foot um, making, making our clothes for us uh, I have a sister I have a twin sister and so we are always used to dress alike. But I'll tell you, I hated women dresses. <laughs> <laughs> it just, I just didn't like it. I always, I always felt more comfortable and casual in, in, in pants and slacks. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine how happy I was uh, after, we, after we graduated from high school uh, during the beginnings of the civil rights movement and the other movements that were coming together, a lot of the, the gender roles became relaxed, more relaxed, and then we were able to wear, you know, uh, women were able to wear pants and uh, anytime they wanted. So that was me, you know, I kind of got into a pantsuit kind of thing, you know. Um, but anyway, um, in terms of being re repressed about my identity, I didn't really start to explore it uh, until I was in my middle 20s. And so when Shirley was saying, well, I kissed a girl when I was 14, I'm like, oh, I'm so jealous. <laughs> <laughs> at 14, that was the last thing I, I ever, I mean, I just, we were just so repressed. Um, uh, so really my real sexual awakening and sex sexual awareness came about in dreams i started having dreams of sleeping with women and i'd wake up going wow what, what was that about right because mm -hmm. um, of course i wasn't at the time and um and then i i would start to wonder why 
am I sleeping? Uh, why am I dreaming about sleeping with women? And what does that all mean? And so at, uh, that sort of, um, you, your dreams are, uh, where you can just do, do whatever you want and be whoever you want. So I started to explore that side of why, why that was happening and realized that, you know, I, I liked women. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and then, what, and then what, am, what was I going to do about it? So how were you able to do in terms of work <coughs> situations and were you able to be out and, and wh where did you, what was your journey in terms of working and living your life? What type of work did you do? Perhaps? Yeah, um, well I came up during the, the time with you all uh, with, a, with a confluence of um, uh, lots of struggles going on, mm -hmm. the civil rights struggle, the, um, the gay rights struggle, and the women's rights struggle. Mm -hmm. And I seem to uh, have moved about w between all three, but mostly uh, I really gravitated and stayed with the issues around women's rights. Mm -hmm. um, I really have, have um, worked in the area of um, trying to um, look at gender and gender equality issues for around women. Mm -hmm. And so and so my lifelong work has been dedicated to that. Lifelong work, great. Now, what I am really kind of excited about is, first of all, everybody at the table except me is married. I mean, they've found their significant <laughs> others and they're happy and they're doing that kind of thing. How did you guys hook it up? How did we meet? Details. <laughs> Details. <laughs> Details, yeah. <laughs> Juicy stuff. That's right. Not too much juice. <laughs> you want to go? No. Oh, okay. I, I think we came together. We um, had met a few years earlier when we were both with other people, and we met each other casually at, uh, socially at someone else's house at a party. As in home records. <laughs> uh, no, no. No, not at the time. We were... We were um, we were in other relationships and weren't really looking, we weren't exploring anything else at the time. But um, about a two or three years later, we had both broken up and had, had met at a, um, at a barbecue uh, uh, during the summertime over somebody's house. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know, it was at that time I saw Shirley and I was like, Ooh, who's that? Mm -hmm. And Shirley was saying the same thing. And um, our friends, of course, being helpful, pushed us together, and, uh, and then it, it took, and we've been together ever since. 34 years. Any suggestions for how two people stay together for 34 years? I mean, do you take breaks? Do you, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no, let me just be yeah. clear. I, the one way, I, I've got just a good friend, and I find it's very important to just sometimes be missing for <laughs> you know a day or to just have my own day to take care of myself. How do you and, and let's bring it over to Paul because I hear him over yep. here going. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm like, <laughs> no, I don't play that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't play that. That's right. That's right. <laughs> but but Paul, you just got married. Paul invited. We were there all yeah, together. Yeah, Paul right. had this wonderful, wonderful wedding, wedding mm -hmm. uh, on the Cape and and uh, at your estate. If you will. <laughs> but it was the best, and you know, Paul was totally top drawer about it. So, Mark, talk, talk about that wonderful man in your life. Well, the wonderful man in my life is Charles Evans. You know, um, we just got uh, we got married two years ago, two years ago in July. Congratulations! And um, it it seems like it's been a lifetime actually, because mm -hmm. Charles and I have known one another for most of our um, adult lives. Mm -hmm. We met in 1968, Ooh. and um, you know, uh, he was first year college student. I was just out of high school, not quite in college, but you know, um, it was during that time I was still exploring myself and I, um, I went to New York on my own for the very first time without family and um, decided I was going to stay. I, I act grown up and stayed in a hotel and you know, uh, got room service and the whole nine, but I ended up you know, connecting with Charles by um, going downstairs at the hotel asking the doorman Okay, where are the gay bars in New York? Yes. <laughs> really grown. Uh, yeah, real grown. And he says, "Well, uh, are you are you driving? You need, you need a taxi, sir." I said, "Well, I'm, I I have a car. It's in the garage." He said, "But well, I think you just need to take take a taxi. I'll get you a taxi, and I'll tell the taxi, you know, you're going to go down to Greenwich Village." And uh, it kind of started from there. I ended up at the Bonsoir, and uh, that's where I met Charles. And I'm I was you know kind of um. You know, feeling um, more of a free spirit at that time. I wasn't really out to my uh, family or friends, but I was definitely feeling very uh, much as a, a free spirit. 
we met, and we, it turns out we did a lot of things um, uh, over the years, but the, the end result is that we got married, um, uh, we reconnected, um, I guess it was about five years ago, and we had, it was the right time for the both of us. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you know, we've been doing this dance for too long. We've tried to connect on um, two or three other occasions. And um, we lived together on two other occasions, and it just didn't work out for um, once uh, uh, because of, I guess, um, uh, his responsibility, or he took the weight for it, and I took weight for the next one. And um, at this last breakup, we had an absence for about 10 to 12 years. And once we kind of reconnected to a mutual friend, happened to be in Boston one weekend, and um, I had connected with him, hadn't seen him in quite a while. He went back to New York, where um, Charles was living at the time and saw New York, uh, Charles and exchanged numbers and said, well, uh, why don't you give him a call? And I, he emailed me and I got, a, his, uh, got the digits, so to speak. And <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I made the, took the initiative and made the call and we connected from there. So, Paul, something you shared uh, and uh, I, I have great admiration for you and I can't even imagine the depth of what you feel, felt. But uh, this is the 12th. Yesterday was the 11th, which again was 9-11. Mm -hmm. And so that was a real challenge for you. Maybe you can go a little bit into that now in terms of how you have been able to overcome those, that, that emotional stress. Well, it was, um, uh, it's just now becoming a little easier, I guess, to, um, to be able to talk about the, my personal experience there. You know, um, since my coming out in Boston and moving on um, and with my life, I moved to New York and stayed there for 25 years. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was living and working in Ground Zero mm -hmm. at the time when, um, you know, the planes came in. I saw both planes come in and both buildings fall. So let's hold it there for a minute. We want to do more of this. And then I really want us to talk a little bit more about what we experienced the other day in terms of 50 and over and being, to taking care of each other. So... We're going to come back. We're going to do a part two on this uh, to hear a little bit more about Paul because Paul really did move through the challenges of, of the stress that goes with 9-11. And then we're going to have Shirley and Catherine talk a little bit more about what we saw last night in terms of a film and old, getting older and having somebody there to take care of you. So hang in there with us. We'll be back for part two. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, guys. So what we're going to do next is kind of loosen it up and we're going to do a little cross talking and that cues again let's just find a way for us to if you have something you want to say regarding to what somebody else says okay. just just just, just, just loosen up a little bit Charles my husband yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 that's right hey, okay so I, uh, I I'm glad we got that first kind of piece out the way because I think that she probably made sure she got just the legacy stuff so we can piece that yeah, together. Like Give me yeah, a little bit of time to <clears throat> come out of here. So we want to thank everybody for being with us and I uh, want to go into a blackout. <laughs>